You are listening to We Saw the Devil, an investigative and conversational true crime podcast that deep dives into fascinating criminal cases that are solved, unsolved, or ongoing. From America's Lori Vallow to Germany's Armin Mivas, we examine and discuss the world's most shocking cases. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to follow us online. Check us out at WeSawTheDevil.com and we saw the Devil on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can become part of the show by backing us on Patreon. Hello, everyone, and welcome to We Saw the Devil. This is Robin, and what a week, guys. It seems like the Lori Vallow case had just gone almost dark, no pun intended. And all of a sudden, it has been drop after drop after drop for about a week now. Previously, we were covering the Gabby Petito case, as well as Suzanne Morphew slash Barry Morphew. I've had a host of episodes that I've planned to get out, but it seems like plans change based on information that comes out. So before we get into the nitty gritty and the Lori Vallow update, let's just get our quick housekeeping out of the way. Our website is wesawthedevil.com, and from there, you can find all of our social media accounts as well as our Patreon. If you're liking the show and digging it, you can financially back it and get some cool stuff in return, and that's patreon.com forward slash wesawthedevil. Also, don't forget to go to wsdlove.com. Do you like free shit? Everyone loves free shit. So head over to wsdlove.com. From there, it'll take 10 seconds to file an entry name, some generic information. And then if you leave a five-star review on whatever platform it is that you listen to podcasts on, you get a second entry for that month. At the end of the month, I will pick one person and then you will get a true crime gift, a little a little package in the mail. All right, before we get into the nitty gritty, guys, just wanted to let you know that I do have more episodes and on different topics, might I add, coming out here shortly. Uh, just with the sheer volume of Lori Vallow stuff and considering that we've been following this case very closely since the very beginning, could not ignore it. You know what I mean? Also, I feel naked and afraid and alone, but I will get through this. As many of you may recognize, Brittany is not here with me to discuss the Lori Vallow case. Sad, little sad violin is playing, but we will somehow get through it. Uh, We do have something special for you coming up in the near future relating to the text message, the uh, the almost like borderline sexting that Chad Daybell did to Lori Vallow. We do have a very special presentation for you guys on that. But let's get into it. Uh, Let's just start out. Now, this episode is going to be just the physical documents that came out. Not only did we have a lot of legal documents, actual physical evidence via text messages, emails, things like that, some some interviews. We also had video interviews with the Chandler Police Department, Rexburg uh, detective as well. That is actually going to be in a part two because they were there were like seven or eight of them and they're over either over or almost an hour long each. There's just too much information for a singular episode on this. So this particular episode, guys, is going to be just physical evidence, either court docs, texts, emails, things like that. All right. So starting off, guys, Judge Stephen Boyce granted Chad Daybell's motion to change venue for the murder trial. So we will be packing up and moving away. The court suggested Ada County, Idaho for the location of the trial. So that's going to be really interesting. What was shocking to me is that in that particular hearing, there were only like between two and 400 responses on that questionnaire that they did in Idaho uh, regarding the case and the trial, uh, you know, to potentially use that for the purpose of, um, of moving it. Not a very good sample size, if I do say so myself, but I digress, it is moving. In the same breath, he also denied the motion to import an outside jury and sequester them locally in Fremont. So full stop ahead, regardless, the venue has been changed. Moving on, we received a PDF file where Alex actually received a patriarchal blessing from Chad Daybell on November 24th of 2019. Chad emailed it to Lori again in a PDF and pretty much crapped all over Lori and Alex's parents said, you know, basically, you poor child, you grew up in a household that spoke the gospel, but did not live it. He then went on to praise Alex for his quote, years of dedication to the cause of the firstborn, which years, he then promised him a marriage to someone worthy and with similar talents that he had. And he married Zulema Pastinus just five days after he received this patriarchal blessing. And I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that 
Alex and Zulema's marriage was arranged by Chad? Or do you think that somehow these two people in their late 40s, early 50s, just somehow came together via Chad and Lori and just said, well, we're not getting any younger and got married? I I still wholeheartedly believe that this was planned and arranged personally. But the blessing is very, very odd. And it actually did something else for me, too. It made me realize just how manipulative Chad is. Alex strikes me as a guy. I mean, he's a he's a loser. He had nothing going for him. His entire life has been spent pretty much <laughs> poorly. He was a truck driver and spent all of his money on sex workers or traveling to Colombia for sex workers. So it's just really interesting to see Chad Daybell at, at length give this blessing where he builds Alex up, builds him up, how wonderful is, how dedicated and holy he is. It was just really kind of shocking to see, finally, Chad's work with that. Then we had Zulema Pastenis' interview with Rexburg Police in October of 2020. Now, this interview did take place in Chandler as the Rexburg Police did travel down there. And it was regarding Charles Vallow's murder. So Lori told her that she needed to use all of the elements in order to get rid of Hiplos. Now, if you recall, Hiplos was one of many names that they had for Charles Vallow. It wasn't just Ned Snyder. Ned Snyder was the the dark spirit that was supposedly inhabiting Charles Vallow's body. Lori was really upset that Charles wasn't dying. If you also recall, remember how Lori got really upset because she thought that Charles was going to die in a car crash on the way back from uh, Texas to Arizona. She ended up joking to Zulema that, well, maybe I should just put a lot of medication in his drink, which I'm not sure how that is a joke. But again, what's so interesting about all of this, this dump that's happened all over this last week is that it shows planning. We're talking like a year of planning. This has been in the making for a very, very long time. Zulema told police that on July 12th, the day after Charles was murdered, that Alex and Lori called and invited her over to Lori's house. Alex is the one who answered the door and he hugged her, which she thought was a little bit odd. Lori then told her that Alex shot Charles. And then Alex apparently chimed in and said that more than 100,000 dark spirits came to help Charles and that he had superhuman strength. He legit went on to describe how Charles picked him up and pancaked him. They were in a fight. And then he grabbed his gun and shot him, and he did not feel bad because he had killed a zombie. Now, this is also when Zulema herself admits that she and Alex actually began to speak frequently. So apparently, Alex killing Charles just set off a budding love, love-filled love relationship. Then something else, we have Lori's iCloud account, which a whole treasure trove of information from this. It went all the way back to 2011. It showed Tylee as a wee babe. Uh, JJ, when they adopted him and brought him in, he was also very young. And police in this say that there were no signs whatsoever of Charles Vallow being abusive through messages with Lori. None whatsoever. We then also learned that the first sign of Chad Daybell comes via an audio file of recorded speech given by Chad on November 17th of 2018 in Arizona. That's, a, I believe, earlier than we previously expected. Lori flew from Arizona to Idaho in March of 2019. That is the earliest known flight to Idaho. But let's, let's stay here in March of 2019. There was a long text message forwarded to Lori from Alex on March 2nd. And the message is believed to be from their mom, Janice, discussing Charles and talking to him. Basically, she was talking to him with a spirit guiding her, like a dream. The next day, Alex responds and says, get rid of Ned already. A couple weeks later, by the 26th, Alex texts Lori saying, quote, Ned is alive, just confirmed. Lori replied, it's not Ned, it's a new one. So what's really interesting is that they had just so many names and they would say that this dark spirit took over Charles and another one. I mean, they were really, really just Charles stood no chance whatsoever. In response to her mom's dream, Lori responded to her and said, quote, apparently it is tied to Ned being gone, hopefully today or tomorrow. She and Alex both referred to Charles as Ned, the dark spirit, and apparently referred to Charles as Ned to their parents. So Janice Cox was even aware of what Ned meant. So Lori was very, very much talking and expressing all of these beliefs to her parents, which I think that up until this point, we were kind of unsure of where of where Barry Cox and Janice Cox lied with this. 
There was also an image of Malachite screenshotted on May 5th of 2019, similar to the one on Lori's hand in a wedding photo with Chad. She got the Malachite ring, if you guys recall. Police did actually confirm as well that there was a potential sign of marriage planning between Lori and Chad as early of May as May of 2019. Then we have pictures of the children. We have a picture of Tylee Ryan at Yellowstone that everyone has seen that kind of became the the cornerstone of this case in the picture of Tylee. There was the picture of JJ in red pajamas taken on September 22nd. The gun. I mean, a, a lot of these pictures we were aware of, right? They've been previously released. Remember, Lori was emailing with the Arizona Department of Economic Security regarding payments uh, for JJ's disabilities between September 13th and September 16th. And then another interesting piece is that Brandon Boudreaux, remember around the time um, the Gilbert shooting happened, the attempted murder of Brandon Boudreaux. Uh, So police say that Lori had previously looked up news articles on the shooting, on Brandon Boudreaux's shooting, but had deleted the cookies. Uh, Lori searched for news on it, as well as Alex. He did the same on his device, and then they both cleared their cookies. So the, clearly, they did not want police, law enforcement, or anyone being aware that they were actually searching for updates on that, that attempt. On October 18th of 2019, there was a deleted message to an unknown recipient saying, quote, not sure how long we will be here until our work is done. And police say that that message could be between Lori and Audrey. Also during that time, there were pictures taken of Lori in Hawaii. So around this time, Lori was supposedly in Hawaii. Does anyone know who Audrey is? Is that a new friend in Hawaii? Just a day later, on the 19th, that was the date of Tammy Daybell's death. Someone texted Lori asking her if she had heard about it, and Lori played played coy. She said, nope, I haven't. So police say that the person who texted Lori was her friend Nicole, and Nicole said that Tammy woke up coughing, threw up, collapsed, and died. Again, one more time for the people in the back. Nicole said Tammy woke up coughing, threw up, collapsed and died. And for those of you who are keeping score at home, this is probably the fourth or fifth iteration of the demise of Tammy Daybell that we have heard. First, she was in the bed, then she was on the floor, then she passed away in front of people, and then now she vomited, collapsed, and and passed away. It's really interesting that now someone else has come out with another story. On November 22nd of 2019, Lori was texting someone and she basically said that she texted Tylee uh, and told Tylee to Venmo them. So November 22nd of 2019, she's still faking and covering for Tylee's death. Again, Tylee was deceased at this time and Lori is, is like, yeah, I'll tell Tylee to Venmo you and, and send you a payment. So she was still actively covering for her in November of 2019. And this was just about a week, six days, uh, before the welfare check for JJ at Lori's town home in Rexburg. Uh, She and Chad from that uh, traveled to Salt Lake City to Orange County and stayed until December 1st. On December 1st, that is actually when they flew to Hawaii. Also released was the introductory phone call between Larry Woodcock and the Chandler, Arizona police. Incredibly sad if you want to listen to that. This was in the very, very beginning of the investigation. No information was really known, and it's just heartbreaking hearing Larry kind of describe everything that's going on. Then we have the phone call. Now, this we've actually read the transcript of, but we haven't heard the actual live call. The phone call that Charles Vallow made to his life insurance company, where he discovered that a password had been put onto his account. Now, again, we've read the transcripts, but the full call has been released. And it's it's so sad because you know that he he knew who it was and everything that Charles was going through. He knew that Lori was solely behind it. And then likewise, with a life insurance company, we also received the phone call that Lori made to the company after Charles was murdered. You know, she came in, tried to slide in all sly. And basically, the I laughed out loud when she realized that she was no longer the beneficiary. Like, I actually chortled because you could actually hear the, the seething anger and shock in Lori's voice. But I think that the, uh, it's very much worth listening to, but the agent handled it with class. Just, no, ma'am, nope, you're not getting anywhere with me. Um, but you can actually listen to that active call now of Lori thinking that she made a large payday, and then bam. And so far in this year and a half, going on two years that we've been covering the case, This is probably the most insightful thing I have ever, ever, ever read or come across. And this would be the Chandler Police Department interview with Adam Cox, Lori's brother. Now, this call was made soon after Charles's murder. And 
for those of you who are not aware, Zach Cox, Adam Cox's son, uh, lived with Lori and Charles for a while, was privy to and witness to all of the batshittery and everything. Lori just like going nuts. And he was privy to that and ended up leaving because it just got a little too weird. Thank goodness he did. But in this call, Adam Cox basically told the whole story. He provided a lot of historical context and family context. And you can hear the devastation in his voice. I mean, he is just beyond devastated that Charles was murdered. And he feels like in his soul, he knows exactly who did it. His family, that his own family was responsible. So Adam is LDS. And he began the call by saying just, do you know anything about LDS or LDS? And then he just launched into it. He told the police about uh, how Lori and Alex and everybody thought that Charles Vallow was Ned Snyder, talked about the dark spirit. Adam, you know, with Zach saw that Lori, you know, and also with what Charles was telling him, Charles was texting Adam frequently uh, so much that Lori turned her entire family against Charles. They cut him off entirely to the point where not a single person would actually talk to Charles. He was on his own except for Adam. So Charles and Adam became very, very, very close. And Adam realized that Charles really loved and really cared for Lori. So Adam went to Janice and Barry, his parents, and said, you know, hey, my sister, your, your daughter, your child, she's off the deep end here. It's not safe. Like, something needs to be done. And they told him that, yeah, Lori's disconnected from reality, but she's not dangerous. Just let her be. And at this point, the entire family cut Charles off. Adam also confirmed that Melanie Boudreaux slash Pulowski was also in Chad's group. And Lori is the one who prayed over her marital issues and came out with it and basically said that Brandon is gay. There are a lot of rumors circulating online about Brandon's sexuality. And all of that stemmed from primarily the fact that Melanie Boudreaux said that he was gay. And apparently Lori doubled down on it because in their mind, the worst thing that you can possibly be is gay. That is like the worst of the worst, according to Lori and her family. Adam said that Lori is ruining whole lives, basically everywhere, Texas, Arizona, that she's ruining all of these lives. So Adam decided to fly to Arizona in an attempt for an intervention uh, with Charles. So he and Charles planned this entire trip out. So Adam was supposed to fly in there and then he was going to stay with Alex at Alex's house. But when he arrived there, Alex started ignoring his calls. So then he visits his parents. His parents were like, well, Alex took a week off of work. And Adam said that when Alex usually takes time off of work, he goes to, quote, Columbia to be with women. And Adam said that Alex was sucked into Lori's bullshit, too, at this point. So he was very, you know, kind of skeptical. Now, again, Adam and Charles had plans to meet and do the intervention with Lori. So the morning of the shooting, Charles texted him and said, Alex is here. So the next day, Adam went to go visit a friend in Tucson and told him about it. And the friend Googled Charles's name. And that's how Adam Cox found out about Charles Vallow's death. No one called him. Not Lori, not Summer, not Melanie, not Alex, not their parents. No one. Adam drove back from Tucson and went to his parents' house. And Tylee was there. And Tylee was angry at him, would not talk to him, stormed to the back, and then eventually left. Everyone was mad at Adam. Adam said it was just truly bizarre because here he's sitting on the knowledge that Charles Vallow had just been murdered and his parents are pissed at him. And he goes on to tell the police that I have the best relationship with my parents. We've never even raised our voices really at one another. And we had it out. We screamed at one another. They, the first words out of their mouths were, how dare you? And why is that? That's because Lori, you know, Adam and Alex as the parents, Janice and Barry, saw the text messages between him and Charles talking about the intervention. What happened is that Charles arrived at Lori's house. Alex was there. They murdered him and then read through all of his phone messages. So they were able to discover from the phone as Charles lay dying or deceased, that Adam too was also in town to stage an intervention with Lori. So there was no care for Charles whatsoever. Everyone was pissed at the fact that Adam was there for an intervention. And so at that point, Adam's parents, again, who they've apparently never fought, kicked him out of their house. And then Adam went to go stay at Summer's house. And then Summer completely lied about not knowing and was like, what? Charles died? I had no idea. 
But also, here's the thing on that, too. It has also been dumped and also been released that Summer Shiflet was also in all of this bullshit, also involved in all of it. Also, she actually offered to go kill Charles herself. And Lori told her, no, I need you safe. It's just absolutely insane. It's insanity. The whole Cox family was in on this. And then there's poor Adam trying to do the right thing. Charles gets murdered. And then he's just SOL basically with his family. Also in this police interview, Adam called Alex an expert shooter. He said that Alex planned, you know, about talking about Joseph Ryan, uh, Lori Vallow's previous husband. Alex had planned to taser Joseph Ryan, throw him in a trunk and take him out into a field to kill him. And that's some new information, too, because we weren't aware, to my understanding, to my knowledge, and thousands of hours I've poured into this case, that Alex had actually planned to take him out into a field and murder him. Absolutely crazy, though. But apparently, Adam Cox was was well aware of that. And Adam wholeheartedly believed that Lori and Alex set Charles up with the sole purpose of murdering him. He tells the police that multiple times in this call. And it's insane that the police seemed open to the idea that this was a setup. And also that Lori is the one who hit Alex with the bat in order to give him the cut on his head. If they were aware of this, right? Like in the phone call, the the detective that Adam was talking to made it very clear that they were skeptical of Alex and Lori's stories. But I don't understand how they botched this investigation so horribly. And now here we are, what, two years later and just now getting, you know, this is a murder case. Like I just cannot comprehend. But if you have not listened to the interview uh, between Adam Cox and the Chandler Police Department, please do. It gives a lot of context that I think that we've been missing, especially from a close member of the Cox family, because they are all freaking in on it. Poor Adam. I just absolutely, my heart goes out to him, especially, which we will cover um, in a a follow-up episode in a part two of this news, especially since it really actually appears like Lori and Alex are planning to potentially kill him next. So then we have texts between Charles Vallow and Lori Vallow after Charles found that email that Lori sent Chad as Charles. If you recall, it's the one where she was pretending to be Charles, inviting him to stay with them in Arizona, basically as a cover for Tammy. Charles wrote her and said, tell me why you use my name in fictitious email to send a bullshit email about a book I'm having him ghostwrite for me. It's a fraud and a lie. There's no other reason for it other than to get him to Arizona and have an excuse for his wife. You did this. I had nothing to do with it and you know it. Also, he did not stay with us in November. I will find out. There's a whole series of texts between Lori and Charles and Charles just bless his heart. I just, he was so patient. (laughs) He was so patient and a much nicer person than I ever would have been had I discovered my partner sending emails or messages like this. And Lori just kept gaslighting him and saying, you know, nothing or blaming him for stuff. It was just absolutely ridiculous. Also this week, the autopsy for Charles Vallow was fully released. You can read the findings on it, summary and opinion. Um, Really quickly, the summary and opinion. The decedent is a 62-year-old male who was pronounced deceased on July 11th, 2019. According to investigative reports, the decedent became involved in a physical altercation with family members at his residence on July 11th, 2019. Another individual reportedly produced a firearm and fired at the decedent, striking him. Emergency medical services were called to the scene and pronounced death without transportation to the hospital. Toxicological testing of the postmortem pleural blood is negative for ethanol, tested drugs, and blah, blah, blah. He had no drugs in his system. There was absolutely nothing wrong with him. There were two gunshot wounds. Uh, The first one went into his sternal chest and exited out of his left back. That was into the chest. The second one went into his abdomen, the left abdomen, and exited out of his left shoulder. And that's it for a lot of the documents, guys. There's a lot more. Uh, There's a lot more, but I don't have six hours for an episode, to be honest with you. So those are my big key takeaways from this, the things that shocked me the most. Again, there's a lot of video interviews, like eight of them uh, that we will be covering. Uh, They also even found the ad where Lori Vallow placed Bailey, the service dog, up for adoption for like over $2,000 when she was selling it before she moved to Idaho. So much stuff has come out in this case. Please check out East Idaho News or Justin Lum. They're dripping these documents, which I have a bone to pick. Guy is like, I believe Justin Lum is the one who said it's like 25 or 26 gigs 
for a drop guys just like freaking drop box it for us or something like you can put it all out you don't have to drip it page by page by page by page like one or two pages a day we're all you know we're all adults here we can all handle a full drop of whatever you give us but yeah little by little a lot of stuff is coming out stuff has been coming out since i've been sitting here that i'll have to sort through I will be doing a series and going over some of this. A lot of people have reached out and said, can you please talk a little bit about like what's been coming out? I don't have time to sit on Facebook or go through document by document. So for those of you who have requested it, here you are. Again, I have a couple other episodes that have nothing to do with Valo, Morphew or anything like, or Petito. So those will be coming guys. But that is it for this episode. Again, you can find us at wesawthedevil.com where you can find all of our social media accounts, as well as our Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil. If you're into financially backing the show, other than that, check out wsdlove.com where if you want some free shit, you can get some free shit. All you have to do is submit an entry and then you get a double entry for the month. If you leave a five star review, you can do this every month, by the way, not just a onesie. You can do it every month. If you have any questions, concerns, case requests, our patrons get first dibs on deciding cases. So I'm about to put that up to our patrons this week on what new case I should be covering. But you can always, always, always send an email with a request to and I will put it before the jury. So that's it for today, guys. Until next crime.